Your wealth, especially if it's a small amount of wealth, makes the difference between you being able to resist disaster in your own life, to ride through the knocks and hardships that can happen, and also gives you choice, gives you agency in what's happening in your life. So the ability to have a safe place to keep money and a way in which that money can grow and can work for you I don't think should have any separation between the largest amount of capital and the smallest amount of capital. There should be equal opportunity for all capital. So that's what these networks are for. That's the purpose of these networks. Like everything that we are designing from the point of view of a protocol level in terms of safety and security and decentralization is all around this idea that we want this thing to be safer than anything else you could put your money in. Safer than keeping it with banks or with governments. A, a supranational decentralization centralized system that fundamentally gives every single person a place in which they can have sovereign ownership over their wealth because then it gives so much more agency in what those people can choose to do with it. That's sort of what drives me. That, that's why I think these systems are so important because often people talk about governments using money as a way of oppressing. Right? I'm not sure that that's necessarily true in, in, in a lot of cases, but the lever of power being there can end up meaning that in some future scenario, you end up being less safe than you would be if there wasn't just this international financial place that you could keep money and be secure. And so like this idea of designing for anti-fragility, designing for, for, for a world that makes it harder for one human to oppress another or one human to take away the opportunity or choice of another. And I think that that's, that, I mean, that's why I built. Dear Crypto Community Blockchain Buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites. And our next guest is Pierce, co-founder at Radix DLT. We're going to talk about Web 3.0, scalability, proof of stake chains, and tons of interesting topics. So stay until the very end and enjoy and have a blast. Pierce, such a pleasure to have you, brother. How you doing, man? Thank you so much for having me, man. Doing really well. First off, congratulations all the great success here in London, the backing you guys have. If you let us know what is Radix DLT in 30 seconds. Absolutely. Challenging question. So <laughs> Radix DLT is a public ledger dedicated to helping DeFi builders get everything they need to obsolete traditional finance and decentralize the $360 trillion global financial market. Boom, there you go, that was awesome. <laughs> But you know what's funny? Because obviously Radix DLT has been doing a great job. The community is growing super fast. Shout out to the community out yeah. there. We just crossed a billion dollars uh, of, of total tokens uh, out there in the market and three, $200 million of stake tokens for our security. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. But very few actually see the struggles and the difficulties, right? That uh, happen behind the scenes in this space, in the industry. And I know you have some really interesting perspectives right. on the struggles we're going through as a community. Please let us know that it's not all, you know, happy unicorns and rainbows, right? Sure, right. <laughs> like, I think, I think that like one of the things that ha happens is when like a, a market takes off, people just pick up the tools that are available and, uh, and, and try and use them. And Y Combinator, there's this amazing idea around the, the hair on fire problem, right? If your friend has got a hair, their hair on fire, they don't care about what they're having for dinner later. They just want to put their hair on fire out. And if you hand them a brick, they'll, they'll just smash their head until, <laughs> until they put their fire out. And if you turn up with water, they're going to be like, oh, I want that. I definitely want that. But what's happening at the moment is DeFi is kind of smashing its head with a brick because there's a whole, all of this potential, but then the tools are so poor for what it's doing. Like we've had a billion dollars worth of hacks in the last two years in DeFi as a result of this problem with how to pull the tools are. And the main problem is this, is this language called solidity, which is what everyone in DeFi programs DeFi with. And it's kind of an insane language. So like, if you're from the traditional financial sector and you went to a neobank like Monzo or N26 and you said to their CTO, hey, I want, to build, I want you to build our entire banking tech stack in JavaScript, they would beat you to death with a baseball bat. And that's essentially what's happening. Solidity is based on JavaScript, but it's not even good JavaScript. It's terrible, like this, the syntax is all weird, the way you architect stuff is weird. And so as a result of this awful language, 
we're ending up with hacks and problems and and like lots of de lots of developers are going oh my god defi is amazing like they're coming from the traditional sector the next million developers that we need in defi that every single defi project is going oh my god i need more talent and they can't get it and they can't get it because these great developers come along they look at the tools and they go no way there's no way i am going to build an application that may be managing hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of worth of, of value using this shit so like what we did is we spent the last 18 months working with Solidity developers, working with leading DeFi projects, getting feedback to build a programming language from scratch specifically for building decentralized finance. And to take it from this horrific mess to something that is incredibly intuitive and incredibly easy to use. And we believe that by doing that, you suddenly give something that's easy, intuitive, and secure. You can take it from this niche industry to something that can actually eat the world of finance. That people can be like, hey, yeah, sure, I would definitely trust my money in this you know, program. And that's, that's where we want to get to. And that's coming out at the end of this year. Coming out at the end of this year sounds very exciting. And eating the world of finance, I know scalability is a massive topic that you have deep interest in. You know, going from the internet to Web 3.0, tell us a little bit more about scalability and the background and how it evolves, because we want to get there, right? That's right. where we're destined to right. go. This is, this is the main problem that everyone talks about. It's like, oh, it's not scalable enough. This is what, you know, the L2, the layer two solutions are trying to do on Ethereum. This is what, like, you know, Avalanche, Solana, Polkadot, Cosmos, Radix, all of these layer ones are, are, are solving the problem of. But I think often we come at it from the wrong perspective. Like, for years in the crypto industry where people are like, how can this be mainstream if we're not matching Visa, which is 2,000 transactions per second? Uh, and um, I, I kind of find that a bit hilarious because it's like measuring how much bandwidth we need, um, with, like when the internet first came out, right? And you can imagine people are like, wow, we've got this network of, 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 of computers that we can share information seamlessly, but like how much bandwidth do we need? The early ISPs trying to work out how much bandwidth they need. And it would be a little bit like trying to calculate how much bandwidth you need by working out how many telephone calls and faxes are being sent at the moment. And like you understand now, we understand intuitively that, that, that the bandwidth of telephone calls and faxes, nothing compared to what the internet actually represented. The internet was a wholesale rethinking of how information was shared. Right? And it was and it was millions of times the bandwidth was required from the information sharing that happened pre-internet to post-internet. We're at that precipice for the global financial system and for public ledgers. And so a lot of public ledgers talk about scalability in the form of like a few thousand transactions per second or tens of thousands of transactions per second. And like some people are like, oh, maybe we need a million. But like actually, the global financial system right now does about one million to two million transactions per second globally in the world, right, across all financial markets. Now, DeFi, decentralized finance, one of the beautiful things of it is that it combines multiple applications together. So a single transaction on Uniswap isn't one transaction. One transaction on Uniswap causes three or four or five or six or 10 different smart contracts to update their state, to trade other things, to create like liquidity. So fundamentally, one transaction is 10, 100 transactions. So if you just took global finance as it is today and you put it on top of decentralized finance, what are you looking at? You're at two, 2 million on global finance, so 100 million to 200 million transactions per second, just to take what we already have as finance without reinventing a load of stuff, right? Without actually un uh, properly unlocking the power of what DeFi represents, this way in which you can fundamentally rethink how finance is built, then maybe you're looking at, you know, two. 2 billion transactions per second, because you're building the world global financial system in a single composable application of finance, which is, which is amazing. That's what like, gets me up out of, bed, out of bed every morning. But like, that's why we built Radix the way we did, because we didn't build Radix around this idea of, well, we're trying to get to like a 10x or a 100x more than what we have already. It was like, how do you build an infrastructure that can fundamentally scale for the world as it will be and the scale that it will be and not face the same kind of problems that Ethereum is with Ethereum 1 or Ethereum 2.0 and not face the kind of uh, barriers that are, that, you know, all of these new layer ones that are coming out don't actually think about it from the point of view of what's the, what, what's the future demand going to look like. They're just like, well, how do we do a bit better than we have today? And that's the fundamentally different approach Radix taken. That is very, very cool. And just as 
this scalability and just seeing the future, you said, of DeFi. Speaking of the future, Pierce, I would love to ask you, like, obviously, what were some of the, the highlights of this year, 2021? And the lowlights as well, if you want to show them, you've been talking about like scalability issues, some lowlights, but also the future, 2022, what are some things, some features, some specific asset classes or functionalities that you really look forward to seeing? Sure. So like, I think some of the highlights of DeFi uh, in 2021 have, have just been the maturity, the maturing of the space, right? Mm -hmm. Like there was this early like Cambrian explosion of ideas that came out in DeFi summer. Um, and then it, it went from like this, this like some very like solid projects that have been building for a very long time, like Aave or like uh, like MakerDAO. Uh, and, and then there was this like sudden understanding of being able to compose things together and then yield farming came out. And it suddenly went through this very speculative bull run of like, well, what matters is capital and how you bring capital and liquidity into the space. And now it's now it's now we've gone through that period and now we're starting to have more serious conversations about well how does this actually interface with traditional finance how do we get institutions involved but that has also been some of the the, the down the, the negative points as well because regulatory landscape is still uncertain people are still worried about what the SEC is going to do and what their approach is going to be and every single regulator in every single country is still trying to work out like how to do this properly and I think that we're, people are feeling a little bit like and it's not exactly the same because the, the 2017 ICO boom, there was this huge bullishness that went that, that exploded, but there was no real products yeah. that came out of it, right? So people were like, oh, we're we gonna have a token, banana token or Apple token or like a marketplace for labor or whatever, but very few things actually got built. Mm -hmm. The difference between this one has been things got built. And so the, 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 a lot of the bullishness was justified. And now we're in this phase of next phase of like, well, let's consolidate the things that are clearly working and, and work out how to do the next phase. Now, what I'm really excited about coming out next are things like the, what I'd say the next level of sophistication of financial products, right? So we, we started with like loan markets and trading. And now we're moving towards synthetics and futures and options and derivatives. And that, from the point of view of starting to eat what the biggest traded volume in the global financial system is today, and bringing that into the DeFi space is really exciting. But also at the same time, we're still facing the scalability problem, right? So that for me is the other negative is like we are we are stopping just you know the 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 people who don't have a huge amount of capital from being able to come and play and find out this new world like if you go on ethereum you know 50 bucks in gas 100 bucks in gas that's going to eat into most people's like initial capital when they when they try and do it so there's all of these struggles there's the, like there's some really good ideas there's, there's, there's your normal scams and rug pulls and things like that happening in the space. Uh, and uh, so I'm really bullish about the future, but I think that there is, there, there's, a, there's a lot of challenges coming down the road as well as the, the less good, more like shilly part of the industry con continues to create this regulatory problem and overhead where the, the rest of the industry is just trying to build shit for people that people want to use, right? Like just, just trying to build good products that help people in some way. And that, that for me is why I, I love the space and then also why I simultaneously really dislike some parts of the space. Well. Yeah, it's, it's a love-hate relationship, right? It's like, how do I feel here? It's, ah. Oh. Right. Um, but you mentioned something really interesting because the decentralized derivatives, as you mentioned, derivatives is one of the biggest financial markets in the world. Right. Uh, it, and a lot of people just on a panel earlier were saying that a decentralized derivatives is, or perpetual swaps and all these are some of the biggest innovations coming down the line. Right. Why, why do, you, do you think so? Why do you see that as such a fascinating like feature to follow. So the, 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 the concept of a, a derivative um, basically allows you to describe in a very elegant, capital efficient way, if it's done well, um, a, 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 a way of getting exposure to anything, right? So it's like, it's like a financial primitive that's an abstract idea but you know you can turn it into exposure to um, foreign exchange or exposure to the equities market or anti or, or hedging against the anti equities market. You know, like this idea of being able to hedge your position against. Uh, let's say let, let's take a really simple example. One of the reasons that DeFi can be a little bit hard to to access from the point of view of anyone who's not American mm -hmm. is because everything is in U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. 
right? And so what you're often doing as a, as a consumer, if you talk to the everyday consumer, I, I've had these conversations where I'd be like, why don't you invest in American equities? Now, nothing to do with crypto. Why don't you invest in American equities? Well, it's priced in dollars. It's like, well, why is that a problem? It's because I don't think in dollars. I think in pounds, right? I, and, I, and I don't know what's going to happen to the pound. And so, like, that could have a massive impact now on what's going to happen to the dollar. Yeah. So, like, how do we make DeFi investing uh, more accessible? Part of that is going to come down to being able to have it in your cleared in your local currency. But how do you do that without segmenting liquidity uh, so that you're not going, oh, here's the GBP pool and here's the USD pool and here's the yen pool. You want a single, like, wholesale market, but then you want the consumer to be able to access individually. That's where things like derivatives come in. Now, they are complicated instruments. So the first thing that's going to happen is going to be complex traders who are trying to get like create um, sophisticated positions that mean that they that the risk exposure to the market is not too big and that's what's happening now and that's why people are excited about per perpetuals because it gives you a capital efficient way of trading things and hedging things that's great but I see in like five years time in ten years time a huge opportunity for creating bundled products where you know i'm i'm just i'm borrowing i'm borrowing or lending in gbp in the back end there's a bunch of currency swaps that are happening and to hedge that position so that the market can be liquid but from the consumer they just single interface really easy and and it, and it takes away all of that complexity by having the facility for the complexity, but making it programmable so that people can just bring all those things together and create great products. Again, great products, great products. for people. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And by the way, guys out there, question of the week, what do you think about regulated DeFi? Tell us why in the comment section below and you'll be eligible for a prize. And speaking of DeFi, there's one thing that I saw earlier. So I received this business card when I was in the lounge, you know, grabbing a drink, coffee. And I saw on the card, it said regulated DeFi. Right. And kind of like, you know, those are two words. It's almost like an antonym, you know, for some people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, you talked about regulatory scrutiny earlier. Yeah. I'm going back a little bit to that, but um, is that also a big topic of 2022? Yeah, so like, um, you're, you know, Aave Pro, One Inch Pro, um, I, I think Compound's doing something. Like, I don't think they are antonyms, right? Because like, first of all, decentralization of a public ledger and permissionlessness is so important from the point of view of anti-fragility, right? So I want a system that can be broken, that, that, that can be attacked in any given part and can self-heal and continue, right? That it is, it, is, it is very difficult to stop once it's in motion. That's what you want for a layer one because fundamentally that's what you wanted for the internet. The internet was designed, the protocol of the internet was designed around the concept of nuclear war where entire cities or continents could be destroyed. And it was designed to be robust and, and, and uh, against that. And you want the same thing through these public ledgers. So public decentralized ledgers want to be as decentralized as possible. However, a public decentralized ledger is a programmable set of rules. And there's no reason that you can't have a permission system on top of a public decentralized ledger. You have the best of both. You have this ability to go, I will be regulatory compliant, but the infrastructure on which it is based is the safest possible infrastructure it can be because of that anti-fragility, right? So I see there's a lot of institutional capital that wants to move some of that, some of that capital into DeFi. And for good reason. There is a global yield famine because of the amount of money that has happened in terms of quantitative easing, in terms of like um, the, the government subsidies that have come in, the, the ways in which COVID has affected the global economy, is very little places for, for capital to get good returns in the real world. However, in DeFi, we are fundamentally reinventing finance and all of that innovation is creating yield opportunity and all of these institutions are sitting there going, wow, I really would like to get some money in there. And so there is going to be a theme in the next year about people working out that very nuanced line of how do we build great infrastructure that doesn't lose the core of what makes DeFi special, but also understands that we live in a world that regulation is in place and that regulation isn't necessarily always a bad thing. Like the regulation is there for protection and the regulation is required for a lot of people to even to allocate capital into the market in the first place. And if we truly want to, decentralize the global financial system, then this is the kind of stuff that we have to learn. Now, 
I think that permissionless finance is so important because it's first access to finance, like the un, like the underbank, the people who just don't get access to these to these products, often are are are, are, uh, are blocked from being able to use these products because of the KYC AML rules can can stop you know certain people just like a refugee or someone in Africa from being able to access it, right? So I think. That's really important from the point of view of financial inclusion. I also think it's really important from the point of view of experimentation, right? Like, how do you create, how do you let a small team that is just like in a dorm room, like experiment with building a, you know, a new financial application if they have to have a million dollar, you know, uh, compliance stack? So I think permissionless finance will always have a place, but I think that for the larger capital to come in and for us to actually start to be like a mature industry as well, that space is going to grow. And, uh, and actually, incidentally, Radix, one of the things that we built is something called Instapass, which is a, a single sign-on AML KYC compliance toolkit for builders if they want to build compliant DeFi on top of Radix. We've got that. It's not obligatory, it is a choice, but if you want to build for this institutional capital, those are the kind of tool sets you're gonna need. That's a great motivator. Really appreciate everything you said, Pierce. It's been an absolute pleasure, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and blast that bell notification to get access to more of these timeless interviews. Premiere at a PC near you every Friday. See you next week, guys. Yeah.